Thanks, Ashley. Um, so as Ashley said, we're going to be kind of going over how you can leverage um, engineering simulation to improve medical device design. And so my name is Chris Smith. I'm one of the CFD simulation specialists here at RAND Simulation. And my background is primarily in the theoretical aspects of blood flow and heat transfer in the human body. And then I've got some practical um, applications as well under my belt with uh, blood pump designs. And Dan, you can go ahead and introduce yourself here. Hello everyone, my name is Dan White. I am new to RAND, but I've been a CFD analyst my entire career, a little over 25 years, and probably half of that has been in medical devices. All right, so we can kind of dive into this. Uh, Dan, if you wanna to go to the next slide here. So the first thing that we really think about whenever we're discussing using simulation in a field is where does it fit, where's the benefit, and where do you really see um, that cost-saving measure as a result of it. Because the last thing that we want to do is try and force simulation into a field where it isn't necessarily fit. So when looking at the medical device field, um, we're really focusing in on three factors here. And this is typically what we do whenever we look at how simulation fits in, is safety, time, and cost. And so at the end of the day, a lot of these things do end up boiling down to cost, but there's also notable um, aspects of time savings with medical devices where you accelerate the path to regulatory approval and safety and understanding really the aspects of your device, the physics of it, and what some of the root causes for potential issues can be. And so when we dive into a lot of this, and this is what we'll focus on throughout the extent of this presentation, um, is that we're really just focusing on how can we take medical device advancement and use simulation to accelerate that product, make that product more safe, more reliable, make it easier as we go through the in vitro tests, whether it be animal studies or clinical trials, and really saving time on that development and consequently saving costs through it. So time is money. And so whenever we're able to save time on develop developmental phases, we're consequently saving on costs. And on top of that, we also have other cost saving measures within using CFD or FEA or whatever be it from a simulation aspect in the medical field. But really this all starts out with the product life cycle. And Dan, you can go to the next slide here. And so when we're looking at the product life cycle, we're trying to see where does simulation benefit us throughout this process. And the goal really with any product life cycle in the medical device field is to bring safe and effective devices to the market while simultaneously reducing time and cost to achieve regulatory approval. And so, the areas where simulation starts to fall in this kind of fall into four primary areas. And they're really the four primary areas of any product life cycle. And the first of that is design. So this is the invention, prototyping, and essentially the drafting up of what the concept is. And so CFD can really help and accelerate this phase of the process by either doing virtual prototyping. So you're quickly able to draft up a prototype and simulate it without having to go through the fabrication process and the lab testing process or even iterating on a prototype that's already been developed. So you have a prototype, you've done a lab test, you understand that it is feasible, it does what you're hoping it does, but you wanna know how to improve it. You can start that process through simulation. And in that, I'm not necessarily saying by any means that you remove components of prototyping or benchtop testing through this, but you use simulation as another tool in your, your belt here to try and accelerate that process. So you're no longer crippled by uh, prototype fabrication lead times or uh, backups and lab testing at a, at a company. And so you really have essentially another tool in your belt in that process. Moving forward into the clinical aspects of it, you can actually simulate a, a, like a preclinical test. And what this would be is creating a, either a virtual prototype of a patient or an animal test that you're expecting to do and actually simulating your device in that environment to see what potential risk factors might show up in the process, um, or if you're going to have any potential issues as you go through it to really make sure you're putting your best foot forward as you advance into these more costly and time-consuming in vitro tests, that you're not going to be consistently going to the animal test and having failure after failure. You're able to evaluate some of that in advance using simulation or even in tandem using simulation to try and predict what are some of the outcomes we might have so we can make sure we're addressing those before we even see the final results or coming up with design ideas before we maybe see a failed animal testing study. And on top of that, as you go through the clinical trial, you can even develop virtual patients um, based on computational models to help 
predict clinical endpoints. So what some of the conclusions of that trial could be either for um, support and moving next to the next generation design and how you can improve upon it, or in ways that you can ensure that the next time you move to that phase that you're going to see a success. You can also use simulation and regulatory affairs and quality assurance. Now this gets a little bit more into CAPA's FDA approval, and I'll discuss that a little bit more here moving forward, but really simulation is used as a, an assistive tool in these affairs. And so whenever you're moving towards regulatory approval, you can use simulation evidence from the design and preclinical trial phases to back up what you're seeing in those trials to make sure that your points are crystal clear and that you have proven efficacy, efficiency, and safety in your device going forward, not only in a clinical aspect with regards to specific set points, but additionally in simulation, potentially even expanding the bounds of applicability for your device. On top of that, when you're dealing with CAPAs and quality assurance, you can use simulation to really get at the root cause of some of your issues. So you're not taking your device and making guesses as to what changes we can make to solve the problem. We can actually use simulation evidence, and that could even be simulation that was done in the preclinical trial phase or the design phase, to really get an idea of what is the root cause of what we're doing here? What assumptions did we make that weren't accurate when we designed the device or went through those animal testing? Um, procedures and make sure that we have an understanding of what's actually causing the issue as opposed to just slapping a band-aid on the device and hoping that it functions continually. You can go to the next slide here. So an area where there's been uh, quantitative evidence of simulation or in silico clinical trials working uh, was one for Medtronic. They had a product where they were able to release their product two years earlier, substantially reduce the number of patients involved in clinical trials, and as a consequence of that, they saved a massive amount of money, over $10 million in doing so. And on top of all these savings for them in particular, they also now had a product that was on the market two years earlier. And they were able to treat an additional 10,000 patients during, patients during that time span because they got their product out earlier. So it's more definitive evidence going towards there are quantitative benefits to using simulation or using computer modeling early on and throughout your, your product design phases. And that can be seen through saving on times in terms of product to regulatory approval and submission into the market. Um, like you see here, reduction in the number of patients that are required for clinical trials, and then associated hours and costs with those hours from your engineering team. So you can go to the next slide here. And with regards to um, in silico trials and the FDA approval process, um, the FDA is actively pushing towards having um, numerical simulation, whether it be computer models, CFD, FEA, incorporated into their process to try and assess devices and drugs, including their potential risk to the public and their overall device performance, um, and really leveraging it as a tool to advance what we can do in the space. Um, the, the committee, the Senate Fiscal Year Committee for the FDA actually urged the FDA to engage with device and drug sponsors to try and explore greater use of simulation methods for advancing technology and new device designs and drug therapy applications and trying to push this into the FDA process to a degree where instead of doing a large number of animal studies and clinical trials, you could potentially start to use CFD to um, reduce the weighting that is set on those specific in vitro studies to make it more of a balance sheet across the board. So instead of having all in vitro studies, bench top tests that prove the efficacy of your device, you can alleviate some of that physical evidence by providing CFD. Now, again, this is something that the FDA is in a process with. It isn't yet implemented into their, um, their set here, but you can go to the next slide here. Tina Morrison, um, she is the Director of Office and Regulatory Science and Innovation at the FDA. And she's also the chair of the ASME Committee on Verification and Validation of Computer Modeling, has been trying to push this through the FDA process, getting down into the CDRH approval process. So instead of having them solely look at these bench shop experiments, animal studies, um, clinical studies as the primary forms of evidence, and how they can use CFD to back up information from these studies, so all of the weight isn't on those in vitro tests. You have simulation that can be used to facilitate points um, across the board. And she specifically noted that there are two primary components or ways currently 
that simulation can be used to facilitate the approval process. And that's when simulation are used as supporting evidence of a marketing application for a medical device. So that can be something that's already in the field looking to expand where it's going to be used or direct simulation of the medical device to support clinical decisions. So essentially, again, giving that supporting evidence on what the medical device can do in the, the simulation realm or in the computational realm as support to what is seen in some of the animal and clinical studies that are performed. And so again, this is from Tina Morrison, who's one of the directors at the FDA, and she's actively been pushing to make sure that CFD, FEA, and other modeling methods can be actively incorporated into the FDA process or the FDA approval process to help limit the weighting that's hold, held on uh, those in vitro tests, to help move towards um, a method where you can get devices approved quicker by leveraging simulation. And so that all kind of, again, ties towards that product life cycle and how you can use simulation in the product life cycle to save time, money, and increase the safety of your device, get it to market sooner. Um, I'm gonna kind of discuss a little bit more on how you can see this directly applied in your specific scenario. So if you wanna to go to the next slide here. Currently, the ways that ANSYS or simulation are used in the medical field is broad spectrum. Um, you see it across the board, and I've listed a couple of them here on the slide. Again, it goes past on the slide. But currently, 88% of the top 50 largest medical device companies utilize ANSYS in their design process. And they do so whether it be pharmaceutical manufacturing, surgical room design, simulating disease spread, drug delivery, heart valves, pumps, design catheters. Again, across the board, you see it spread out. Um, and again, this is where you can start to leverage numerical simulation to benefit your product design cycle. You're not replacing benchtop testing, you're not replacing in vitro studies, but you're helping to use it to facilitate your process so you're not spending time waiting on fabrication of prototypes. You're really accelerating that entire process throughout. And today we're gonna focus a little bit on one specific area. Obviously, we can't cover all of these areas in a webinar and me being a CFD specialist, similar to Dan, um, we really tend to focus in on the catheters, heart valves, and heart pumps. Obviously, simulating disease spread, drug delivery, surgical room design are all similarly CFD applications. But today, we're going to try and focus in on catheters and heart pumps to really show how you can leverage CFD to go through a process of design evaluation and look at things that you can't see necessarily as readily in a bench top test without actually performing a, an animal study or something similar. And so you can go ahead and go to the next slide here, Dan. This is really focusing in on where we utilize simulation in these two realms. So again, this is for blood pumps and catheters. Both of them are components that can have significant impacts on uh, blood health, so blood damage. But when we're looking at how to use CFD, we can really have it extend past that. We can look at rapid virtual prototyping. So essentially, instead of saying, hey, I've got 10 prototype ideas that I think are fit for fabrication, you can run those in a simulation in advance and say, I only have two of these that I think are going to perform the best based on the CFD result. And that could be overall design performance, efficiency, and efficacy of the device, or actually evaluating the potential for blood damage from those, those prototypes. And then while those prototypes are being fabricated, you can start to either simulate additional prototype ideas, simulate design concepts as spin-offs of those prototypes, but you're really using simulation as a tandem tool to the normal bench top experimentation that you would do. And with blood pumps and catheters in mind, one of the most um, critical components that you can actually evaluate using CFD that you can't do as easily in a bench top test is the potential for blood damage. So whether that be um, through hemolysis, thrombosis, you essentially are able to evaluate this to try and reduce how much blood damage you have as Blood damage obviously increases the risk of clotting, strokes, or even multiple organ failure in the worst, one of the worst case scenarios. And so we can use CFD leverage early on in the process to start to whittle out designs that are gonna be complete no-gos because of the amount of blood damage that they would provide. Potentially saving us hundreds of hours if we took one of these designs all the way through a prototyping stage into the animal study and then found out in the animal study that our device was creating thrombosis or hemolysis and causing strokes in the animals or multiple organ failure. <clears throat> and so 
Again, the areas that we really focus on here are platelet activation, which is thrombosis stage one, flow stasis, which is thrombosis stage two, and hemolysis. Now, for these three mechanisms, there's really no standards for models for these. But there have been models that have develop, been developed that correlate well to lab studies, um, specifically for hemolysis here, which will be our focus. But you can see on the right image here, this was taken from a study where they did um, a design of experiments on a blood pump to trying to determine which one produced the lowest levels of hemolysis and thrombosis. And they were to able to evaluate all of this through CFD and later verify the results through a prototype design. Now again, there's no standards for any of these. Um, there are plenty of ways that you can look at each of them individually, whether it's through just static shear, shear stress values, or actually looking at the time average waiting for each of these mechanisms. And so if you wanna to go to the next slide here. Again, today we'll really focus in on the hemolysis model in particular, looking at how it works in catheters and blood pumps. And so this is just a little bit of background on that hemolysis model. I'm not gonna go through the details of all of it, but in essence, if you're interested in it, we can send you the paper that it's referencing, that's task in 2012. Um, he goes over and actually evaluates several different hemolysis models and how they apply to different real world situations. So looking at how hemolysis models predict hemolyzer H comparison. So essentially looking at the actual value of hemolysis versus the predicted model. And then doing that again for the Centromag pump. So looking at how does this apply in a more realistic scenario in a pump and specifically. So on top of the hemolysis model, obviously there's plenty of components to modeling uh, blood and CFD. One of those is modeling it as a Newtonian or non-Newtonian uh, fluid. We won't get into this too much in depth, but just note that it isn't necessarily a, a very critical component in that you can really easily simulate the difference between the two. There are very well-known non-Newtonian and Newtonian blood models that can be implemented into CFD, and you can analyze to see if there's a substantial difference in the flow field level of hemolysis generated and other things like that. And so really CFD provides the ability to quickly iterate through designs or design methodologies to make sure that you're capturing everything correctly and you're not making unreasonable assumptions. And this can even be used moving forward into benchtop experiments. If you run your simulation of a Newtonian versus non-Newtonian fluid, you can really easily start to evaluate, do I need to make the jump into using a non-Newtonian fluid right off the bat in my experiments? Or could I use something that's simpler to deal with? Um, and again, kind of coming back to this, there's not really any standards for hemolysis or thrombosis, but there are some goals that you can use that correlate well between models. So you can see on the image on the right, even though the absolute value of these hemolysis models doesn't always line up perfectly with the experimental value, you do see very similar trending between them. And so whenever we're using hemolysis or thrombosis modeling in CFD, we always wanna keep in mind that we may not be capturing the true absolute value of it, but we are obtaining great trending curves. So we can compare one design to another. Um, that way we can really easily evaluate if we have 10 prototypes, which two, three, or four prototypes are going to work the best when we move them forward through the fabrication and actual prototyping phase and into those animal studies. And so from here, I'm gonna hand it over to Dan, who's actually gonna go through two specific examples, one of a catheter and one of a blood pump. Dan, you've got the floor. All right, thanks, Chris. So uh, first thing we're gonna do is go over uh, some catheter results simulation that I ran. And then after that, we're actually gonna bring up the software and I can show you a live demo when we look at uh, the blood pump. So first looking at the catheter, obviously this is a very simple geometry. We're just trying to point out the features of the software and what you can use CFD uh, to obtain, what knowledge you can gain from it. So we're just looking at this step in, you know, step at the inlet of the catheter versus tapering that and what impact that's gonna have on the uh, fluid dynamics. So first, obviously the velocity is important and we, we wanted to focus on the hemolysis model. So we kind of ran some unrealistically high flow rates. So like you see here, two liters per minute through this catheter. So the velocities are very high, eight meters per second roughly, which isn't typical, but it's just to show the hemolysis uh, model really to highlight that. And 
first we're going to look at shear stress because typically that's what's been done in the industry is you look at shear stress in the fluid. The hemolysis modeling is a relatively new thing. And to be honest with you, personally, I've kind of dismissed it in the past that I said, oh, that's what these uh, PhDs do, you know, in academia, they're working on stuff and that's all well and good. But I didn't see the practicality of it. But I will say looking at this model, I do have a different opinion about that today. We'll go into that in more detail shortly. But what you see here, I've plotted the shear stress up to this limit of 150. So anything that's pink is beyond our, you know, A threshold for hemolysis. Like Chris was saying earlier, there's no hard numbers, but you can find in the literature this 150 uh, there, but other numbers as well. We're going to use that for our purposes, the 150. So you can see both models show very high uh, shear stress at the inlet, of course, where the velocity is very high. But what I wasn't really expecting and was uh, quite interesting is when we look at this hemolysis uh, model, this uh, hemolysis index is what I'm plotting here. And the level of it is somewhat arbitrary and we're not gonna try to tie any thresholds to it. But what we do is compare design A to design B, you know, which one is better. And to be honest with you, when we first built these models, we're thinking, oh yeah, tapering is gonna be the way to go. You know, it's gonna reduce the shear and everything. But, we learned uh, quite the contrary here that uh, you see more regions of high hemolysis in the taper design than we did in the uh, step, which was a little bit surprising. When you look more closely, you can see why that is because the flow still separates, although you can't see too well. Even in this mild, I think it was yeah, 10 degree taper, the flow still can't stay attached to the wall. And we still have very high velocity next to a very low velocity recirculation zone here, whereas uh, contrary in the step, you see the velocity immediately dissipates as it issues into this plenum. So you don't see the larger regions of hemolysis uh, in that design. So that was a quite interesting and not intuitive finding, at least for me. Okay, so I'm going to look at now more typical flow rates because another thing that's a concern in these catheters is regions of stagnation, uh, and especially those are going to occur obviously when the flow rates are lower. And if you have stagnation regions and you've activated the platelets, they can collect there and thrombus can form very easily. So here we're looking at the same two designs at a lower flow. So 0.2 liters per minute as opposed to two liters per minute. And again, these are velocity contours. Obviously the max is way down. And you can see these are, this, this is an unstable configuration. The jet, it wants to attach to the wall. So if I stop the simulation a little bit further in time, you know, it might be attached to the other wall. It's just gonna kind of uh, go where it wants to. There's no steady fixed solution in these jet problems. But what we're showing here now is uh, regions of low wall shear. So that's going to be indicative of low velocity and regions for potential clotting. And so anything in blue is definitely a region where uh, clots are possible and maybe more, more probable to occur. And you can see obviously in the step case, we have that shelf, right? And so you have this sharp corner and nothing's happening there. So you're going to have a lot of potential for thrombosis because of the stagnation in that region. And the tapering, although the flow did still separate, you see less of the dark blue. So dark blue is bad, right? Because it's very low shear stress. And so you see less potential for thrombosis in the taper design, although it had higher uh, potential for hemolysis in the high flow cases. Okay, uh, that's basically all I want to show for the catheter. And I'm going to go into a demo of the pump now. So the first thing, this is just an impeller I designed from scratch. It's not optimized or anything. It's just for illustrative purposes. So we've got the impeller and a diffuser. And just to set the stage, this thing is running at uh, 22,000 RPMs and delivering five liters per minute of blood flow. And as Chris mentioned earlier, we are using a non-Newtonian model and the hemolysis model, which this was actually my first time dialing in this. And I have to say, I, I found it quite interesting and very informative. And so I'm excited to share those results with you all. So what you see here is a plot of shear stress with the same threshold I mentioned earlier, the 150 pascals. And as you can see, this thing's spinning very fast. So most of the surfaces of the impeller and uh, diffuser are above that threshold, which you would expect in the device spinning this fast. So then I thought, hmm, what if I could uh, use that hemolysis index 
and create a similar contour plot with that to try to set the level of the hemolysis prediction to something similar. So in other words, sort of analogous to my, the traditional looking at shear stress, you know, I want to look at a comparable level of the hemolysis. So I have a similar plot here. Uh, let's see. Okay, so all I did was I tweaked the maximum value that I'm displaying here to get a contour plot that was similar qualitatively to the plot you just saw of the wall shear stress. Obviously, they're never going to be the same, and I just played around with a couple of numbers to get something that was close. So I'm targeting the red areas uh, and attempting to make them comparable to the areas you saw in the wall shear contour plots. So I, I was happy enough with this. Although obviously it's not going to be exact, it'll be close enough. And then what I want to do is now look at the fluid domain. So we've got the surface of the impeller, but we also want to see what's happening inside the domain, the fluid away from the impeller and away from the walls. So I created a plot. Uh, let's see. Here it is. So now that's the same counter plot of shear stress that I showed before in the impeller, but now I've incorporated the slice plane through the entire domain to show what's happening in the fluid as well. And you can see there's some pre-swirl here and that region near the wall, this small area right here in red, you can see that's what we're predicting with the shear stress to be region of concern, right? Potential for hemolysis because we've got these levels of shear stress that are exceeding this 150 pascals. So now I said, okay, I set that uh, threshold on the hemolysis index to be something comparable, you know, as I did earlier uh, in that step with the impeller itself. So now I'm going to show you the similar plot of hemolysis, or the hemolysis index, sorry. So, okay, this, I, I hope you guys are as surprised by this as I am. Uh, what this is indicating is the hemolysis model shows that all that area of pre-swirl up here is actually exceeding that same threshold, if you will. Uh, so it's an area of concern that we would not have seen. If I was saying, you know, strictly historically how we've done it, wall shear stress alone is saying, oh, the only reason we have to be concerned about for hemolysis is right near the wall. Well, when I run this hemolysis model, it's indicating no, there's a lot more area of concern. And that's because the flow gets trapped in here in the pre-swirl. And it just hangs around, lingers here, and the hemolysis model is it, it takes the time effect into account, or wall shear stress or shear stress doesn't. It it looks at how long the fluid is exposed to these regions of high shear. And I think this is really a nice model, and it, it opened my eyes a lot to see that there are other areas that we would have missed had we just traditionally looked at you know looked at wall shear stress like we would traditionally. So this was quite interesting to me. And I want to show you that pre-swirl and streamline plot. You can see that uh, a lot better. Oh, me, I named that. Oh, maybe not. Shoot. There it is. Okay, got lucky. So these are just particles that I released from the inlet, and it's tracking them uh, through the domain. And they are colored with the hemolysis index. So obviously, they get drawn in. It gets neck down, right? And it gets drawn into the impeller. But it's spinning so fast that it's causing a lot of pre-swirl upstream of the impeller. And some of the particles get caught in there. And you can see their hemolysis level is very high because they're lingering. You know, the shear stress may not be as high, but they're exposed to it for a longer period of time. So the hemolysis model indicates, hey, this is potential for hemolysis. So it's an area to look for, you know, look at. Now, Chris, is there anything you think I might have forgot yeah. or you might want to point out? No, I think that was good. I mean at the end of the day when we look at a lot of this we're doing so as as a form of design comparison we want to know how well one design is going to really feed into an overall design perspective um, and so comparing one to the other kind of like what we did with the catheter model and so when we're looking at homolysis like dan is showing here like you said the tradition is obviously just using wall shear stress and looking at when that exceeds 150 pascals but what the hemolysis modeling does is it lets you actually use a, a time dependent function of the wall shear stress. So seeing how long particular platelets or red blood cells are exposed to high levels of shear for, because that's really what causes hemolysis or the, the degradation of the red blood cells is that you have a red blood cell that's exposed to a high level of shear for a longer period of time. 
And so it helps you really evaluate what are my risk factors? Where am I seeing these issues from? Because if you ran this in a benchtop experiment, your first intuition, mine definitely wouldn't have been, that pre-swirl was the primary cause of hemolysis. So we might have seen that there's a lot of hemolysis generated in this model, and we might have said, oh, well, we'll probably have too high of shear stress on the stresses on the impeller blade. Let's try and find ways to fix that, as opposed to getting back to that root cause, which is actually the pre-swirl from the impeller blade. Now, I'm not saying that there's a lot you can do in that regard, but it does give us the information on why it's truly being generated. So we can really focus our problem solving effort on that component specifically, and we don't get misled down alternate roads. So we get to see what's physically happening, in this case, in the fluid domain, see what is happening to the blood. That way we can really determine what's our best area to focus on. Oh, Chris, I just remembered uh, those ISO volume plots. I didn't show those. Those were interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so let me add one more thing here. Uh, okay, so what you see here, the region in red is the 3D, so the volumetric region of fluid, the amount of fluid that's exposed to a shear stress above the 150 pascals. And I can quantify that in the post-processor. In this particular case, that comes out to just under 0.1 cc's. And now, Let's contrast that to the same region. You know, I want to use the hemolysis index criteria. So you can see a significantly larger volume of fluid is exposed to critical shear or that would be targeted by the hemolysis model as, you know, critical or, you know, worth looking at potential problem volume. So, you know, it's more than an order of magnitude higher prediction of the fluid volume that's exposed to these critical limits. So I thought that was quite eye-opening. Uh, again, we would have missed this entirely had we just looked at shear stress.